So welcome Venerable Biko Bodhi for the second part of our interview about your lifetime and your work. Thank you for taking the time. And today I would start with a very funny question. Uh, in the course of time, monks with such a long standing usually get honorific names and additional names. So the name always gets longer in <laughs> the Pali names. Uh, but you always stayed with the very humble monk Bodhi, Bhikkhu Bodhi. What, what would be the long name of you? I guess it would be Mah Mahatero. Bodhi Mahatero. That's all, not additionally uh, names that were given by uh, by monasteries in Sri Lanka? No, no. Yeah. Yes, you are indeed a Maha Mahatera because you are in robes over 50 years, which is quite a long time. Yeah. Are you the one who has the longest uh, period in robes among the Western monks? No, certainly there are two, well, two monks from the Achan Cha tradition. One is Achan Sumedo. Mm. And then another is another a British monk now in, in, in England, Achan Kemadamo, the Kemadamo, oh. mm -hmm. who he actually he has a place, I think it's Warwick, England, which is called the Forest Hermitage, just mm -hmm. like the place where I stayed in Candy. Which will be also our main subject today, because today I would like to try to cover with you the 30 years of your middle age, so to say, from 20, age of 28 till 58, uh, which was mainly the time in Sri Lanka with an interruption of about five years coming back to the States, yeah. going back to Sri Lanka again. Yeah. If I counted right, it was like five years of becoming a monk and your first trainee time and then you went back to the united states for about five years and you went again to sri lanka for yeah, about yeah. 20 years yeah. is that correct from yeah exactly so exactly so and among this 20 years you stayed with venerable nana ponika terra mahatera one should say from uh 10 years about, I think, from 1984 till uh, his death in 1994. Yeah, though so actually I stayed with him from the time I came back to Sri Lanka. This would be May 1982. So I stayed with him through to the end of that Vasa, the Vasa of 1982. So I was there until November 82. So this would be June, July, August, September, October, about six months, close to six months. Yeah. Yeah. Then I went to stay at the place called the Saranavaniya. Another forest monastery in... Yeah, Shanghai. also known as, named after the village Mitarigala. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's a very interesting time because that's uh, the time where you became a monk. You studied as a monk, Pali and Dhamma. And you started your first writing. And most of all, you stayed with the Venerable Yanaponika Mahatera, which is very close to many Germans. So I am looking forward to hear about that. First of all, we finished last time uh, with your PhD in this year of uh, 1972. By the way, a year where many Indian travelers went uh, uh, backpacking or whatever to India many people actually met buddhism in india or in asia at that time it was the time of the discovery of buddhism anyway about that time yeah yeah and we already mentioned that you first became a novice monk in the vietnamese tradition during your study time yeah and i heard from you before that there the name bodhi was given to you right yeah actually my vietnamese teacher I think he gave me a Vietnamese 
name, actually a Vietnamese Chinese name, mm -hmm. and then looked up the Sanskrit equivalent, which turned out to be Bodhi. And so when I met when I met my Sri Lankan teacher, I thought he would give me, and I took the novice ordination in the Theravada system. I thought he would give me a new name, mm -hmm. but you know he saw that my name in the Pali Sanskrit form was Bodhi. So he said, Bodhi is good, keep it. So, yeah, exactly. But, but I wanted to have a name that included part of his name. So I was thinking something like Maitreya Bodhi or Bodhi Maitreya. Mm -hmm. But he said, no, keep it Bodhi. Okay. Which comes very convenient because most people easily remember Bhikkhu Bodhi, yeah. the name. Yeah. yeah. So you travel to Sri Lanka with the aim to become a Buddhist monk. How come you decided for the school or Nikaya, it's called in Theravada Buddhism, of the Venerable Balangoda Ananda Maitreya? Well, I think I mentioned last time that when I was living in Los Angeles, I met the Sri Lankan monk Vajirarama Piyadasi. Mm -hmm. And then after he returned to Sri Lanka, and then I decided I wanted to go to Sri Lanka for ordination. So then I wrote to Venerable Piyadasi, and then he referred me to Venerable Ananda Maitreya. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wasn't thinking of I'm going to choose this Nikaya or that Nikaya. Yeah. It was just a matter of finding a good teacher and one who knew English and one who was well versed both in Pali and in Dharma. So. He was the one that Venerable Piyadasi mm -hmm. referred me to. Did you have to had to learn uh, Singhalese to be a monk there? It wasn't necessary to learn Singhalese to be to become a monk. Mm -hmm. So I managed to pick up a little, just very simple conversational Singhalese. But probably in the course of time, you had only also need to read the Singhalese script. Uh, for translating Pali. Uh, is it right you learn the script as well? Actually, my teacher, Venerable Ananda Maitreya, told me that I should learn the Burmese script first. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because he, he had participated in the Sixth Council in Burma, in Myanmar, oh, yeah. mm -hmm. in the middle 1950s, and they had sent him the complete collection of the Burmese mm -hmm. compilation, including the canonical text, commentaries, sub-commentaries, the whole collection. Mm -hmm. And so he, he had that collection in his library, so he wanted me to learn the Burmese script first. So I learned the Burmese script, and then later I learned the Singhali script. Like Nyana Tiloka, uh, the uh, late monk who who actually translated a lot from the Burmese script. I guess he did use the Burmese script, yeah. He was also uh, attending uh, the Sangeeti in Burma in the middle of the 1950s. Yeah, that's but right, yeah. You never met him, I guess. He already uh, passed no, away Venable, before your yeah, time. Yeah, Venerable Tiloka had passed away in 1957. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was before I even knew the word Buddhism. <laughs> exactly. How was it to become a Buddhist monk in the Sri Lankan tradition of Theravada? Have you been the only foreigner there or had there been others? In Sri Lanka or in the temple where I was staying? In the temple where you were got ordained. Yeah, in the temple where I was staying, actually, there was a German, an elderly German monk mm -hmm. who he just preserved or retained the Samanera ordination. He didn't want to take the Upasampada, mm -hmm. I guess, because it was, he wanted to have a little bit of liberty. He didn't want to be bound by all of the precepts, the more detailed precepts. So he just re preserved the Samanera ordination. So he was living on one side of the hill. I was living on the other side of the hill, but then during my first vasa as a monk, 
I spent that Vasa not in Balangoda, but I went to the island hermitage mm -hmm. near Dodanduva. Mm -hmm. And while I was at the island hermitage, then I got a telegram from my ordination temple telling me that this German monk had passed away. Mm. It could have been like in August, September of 1973. Yeah, his name was, he was ordained with the name Kondanya. Kondanya? Oh, yeah. Anya Kondanya, the first Arahant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The island hermitage, as others may not know, uh, was the island where Nana Tiloka with his students, including Nana Ponika, stayed for a long time. And uh, at that time, did Nana Ponika uh, already reside in Kandy? I guess so. At which the time, time where you, when you visit the island hermitage. Yeah, Nya, uh, Venerable Nyana Ponika had moved to Kandy in, let's see, Nyana Tiloka moved there in 1951. Then I think Nyana Ponika Tarot came, it could have been 1952. Mm -hmm. I saw pictures about him uh, when he stayed in uh, in Kandy. And at that time, it was also a time of Nyana Vira and Nyana Moli. And they all had really much beard. I was surprised when I saw those pictures uh, that they they didn't shave very often their beard. So they had rather long beard at that time. Yeah, I think I know that photograph. Yeah. So you became a novice monk, but then you had to uh, you had to stay as a novice monk for a certain time before you could get higher ordination, or was that fairly short? Yeah, it was actually six months after I became a summon era that I had the the Upasampada, the higher ordination. And, and that was in May 1973 that I got the, mm -hmm. the yes. full ordination. Uh, when you um, started as a monk, novice and high ordination, did you immediately start to learn Pali or was there more an emphasis of meditation and conduct? Yeah, well, even before I went to Sri Lanka, when I was living in Los Angeles, as I, I think I mentioned last time, I started to study Sanskrit because there was a mm -hmm. institute near the place where I was living called the East West Institute, mm -hmm. in which there was a woman who had studied Sanskrit in India. She had a master's degree, I think, from the Benares. Hindu University in Sanskrit, and she was teaching Sanskrit. And so I, it was just about three blocks away from the place where I was living. Mm -hmm. So I studied Sanskrit for a year with her. And then when I came to, uh, to Balangoda in Sri Lanka, then pretty much immediately after I settled in, I turned to the study of Pali. And how did you study Pali, was it through English texts or uh, through, the, in, through the teaching of your uh, Upacharya? Yeah, well, I had some books for learning Pali that were available in, you know, explanation in English. Mm -hmm. So one was called, what I started with, I think it was called a new Pali course, which came in two parts mm -hmm. by a monk called Venerable Buddha Datta, mm -hmm. Ambalangoda Buddha Datta. The one who also wrote the concise dictionary of Pali? Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, I would work under the guidance of my teacher, but, to, you know, doing the exercises and then going to him to, for, to check the exercises from the book. Mm -hmm. And then after about going about halfway through the part two of that series. Then I picked up another book that was available by A.K. Water called, a little misleadingly, Introduction to Pali. That's a nice title. <laughs> yeah, but it should be called Introduction to Pali for Students of Philology. Yeah, he was from Canada, right? 
I'm not sure whether he was originally from Canada, but he did live and teach in University of Toronto for many exactly. years. Exactly. And his, he, might, he might have been originally British. His uh, book became the, uh, the, the main book for Pali study at university. Yeah, so, but it's not mm -hmm. such an easy book. No. But no. I worked through it. Wow. And All by has, yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I had questions and I would ask Venerable Ananda Maitreya. It must, must have been difficult because at that time there were no answers to the exercises from where Yeah, I but I did it anyway, yeah, to the yeah. best of my ability. And how long did it take for you to uh, learn Pali to such a degree that you could read the uh, original sources by yourself? I think I worked through A.K. Waters' book maybe about four months. Mm -hmm. And then I started to read. Yeah, I would. I think that I took the Pali Majjhima Nikaya and to guide me using I.B. Horner's translation. Mm -hmm. Though often I found her translation not very clear. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's a yeah. Um, that's a known thing, which led you la later also to uh, revise Nana Moli's work on the Matimanika. Yeah, 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 but I didn't at that time. I didn't have access to no Venerable Nana Moli's translation. Yeah, I don't remember when he passed away, but it must have been long before your time as well, right? Yeah, I think it was nineteen sixty or sixty one that he passed away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the time when you were 16 or something, right? Oh, yeah. too long ago to meet. And uh, you also mentioned to me that you studied Dhamma at that time. Yeah. Uh, can you tell us a little bit uh, how, how this uh, was happening? Was your teacher teaching you or you were rather reading or? Pretty much what I did at that time was to read through using the English translations mm -hmm. from the, the Pali Tech Society series, reading through, of course, in, in English, mm -hmm. the four Nikayas mm -hmm. and some of the books of the minor collection, and then taking notes on them, sort of like summarizing the suttas. Mm -hmm. and so at this time, I'm reading, uh, learning Pali, going through my initial study of Pali, and then reading the text in English translation. And then at the time, then when I finish the introduction to Pali, at the same time, I'm just about finishing reading the four, the Nikayas in the English translation. And then I start going through the Nikayas again, but this time reading them in Pali alongside the English translations. And at that time, uh, was your interest already focusing on the Nikayas of the uh, Sutta or Suttanta Pitaka? Yeah, of course, that was my primary focus. But most monks would also be introduced to, of course, especially in Burma, but I guess in Sri Lanka as well to the uh, Abhidhamma uh, work of Buddha Gosa, like the Visuddhimagga, which for many is like uh, the the handbook for Buddhism. Yeah, well, my teacher after I think this would have been when I returned. It might have actually been before the first Vasa, after I had learned Pali through A.K. Waters' book. At the same time, I was reading the Nikayas myself in Pali, comparing with English translations. But then he also had me read the Abhidhamata Sangaha. Mm -hmm. That which is, you, of course, the little manual of Abhidhamma. Which you later edited, is that the one? That, oh, that came much, much later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So I think I use Venerable Narada Terra. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Had a book called The Manual of Abhidhamma. Yeah. Which had the, the Pali text, his English translation, and some explanatory notes. But my teacher, Venerable Ananda Maitreya, would give longer explanations and correct some of the, I have to say, some of the shortcomings and mistakes in Venerable Narada's oh, okay. notes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my teacher also gave me Lady Soyador's commentary on the compre on the manual on the Abhidhamata Sangaha, mm -hmm. which is he had the book in Burmese script and it's written in a very complex technical scholastic style of Pali. Mm -hmm. And here I am, I've just finished A.K. Waters' Introduction to Pali, which just deals with sutta-style Pali. But Ananda Maitreya said, here, while you're studying the Abhidhamma, read this along with it. <laughs> and it was really quite difficult, but I did my best to read, read along. How was your daily schedule at that time? I mean, the a monk schedule, including arms round or meditation or chanting or chores. Yeah. You see, the monastery or the temple where I was living consisted of the main building, the temple building, which was in the center, and then there were two kudis, actually three kudis, on the hillside. There were two hills on either side of the center. So on one hill was the kudi where that German monk was living, the German Samanera. Mm -hmm. And then the other hill in the lower kudi, I, I was living in the lower kudi, and my teacher was living in the kudi up the hill. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't put it, and the, the monks in the temple were really just young boys who had been ordained as novices. I think the oldest amongst them was 15 or 16, mm -hmm. and the youngest could have been 10, 10 years. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't participate in the life of the temple. Mm -hmm. I just had my own schedule which I would get up in the morning, do some a little chanting on my own and med meditation. And then after the meditation, the breakfast would come. And then I would do, I think I would do study of Pali in the morning. And then study of Dhamma in the afternoon. Then another period of meditation in the evening and then another period of maybe study later in the evening and then another period of meditation then go to bed mm -hmm. and we didn't go on alms round at that time mm -hmm. so later i learned how to go on alms round mm -hmm. um but the temple would provide the food. So I guess the uh, the usual attendance or uh, serving of the elder, elder monk, in your case, uh, your preceptor, was mainly done by those young novices. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you were not, uh, you didn't have to uh, uh, wash his clothes and be around him. No, all the time. no, 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 no. Yeah, like in, like I, uh, this uh, experience in Thailand, where even if you are very old, you have to go through this procedure of being a servant very much. Yeah. Bante, normally... Yeah, I think I, w I was also maybe treated a little bit like as a privileged person because mm. I was a, a Westerner, an American, coming with a PhD degree yeah. <laughs> to, you know, to study under, in a traditional Sri Lankan Theravada monastery. Hmm. 
Normally, a monk has to be in a time of training for five yeah. years. We call this Nisaya, dependence to the teacher. Yeah. Yeah. But you and normally one is staying at one place for five years. But in your case, you were free to travel a little bit and you went to the Isles, Island Hermitage. And actually, about two or three years of your uh, after your higher ordination, you decided to move to the Forest Hermitage. Is that correct? Yeah, first, the regulation is not that one has to stay five years under the same teacher mm -hmm. and in the same place. But one should spend five years in Nisaya, which means in guidance, that one is staying mm -hmm. under the guidance and supervision of an elder monk. Mm -hmm. But that first uh, rainy season, the first Vasa, my teacher Ananda Maitreya was invited to go to England mm -hmm. and spend the Vasa there. Yeah, there was a Buddhist center in England. I think it was called Oaken Holt. And a number of prominent monks were invited to spend the Vasa at that place. And so he, he was one of them. So he went to England. And so he wouldn't have been at the temple. And I would have been there just alone with the well, the German monk on one side, and then with the little Sri Lankan novices. Yeah, I think he assigned another Sri Lankan monk to look after the novices while he was in England. So I decided to go to the island hermitage to spend the rain, the rains retreat there. And there you probably heard about the forest hermitage, or you knew already because no, I knew I, I already knew about the forest hermitage. In fact, I had met Venerable Jnana Ponika very shortly after my novice ordination. I just made a visit to see the island hermitage. And that would have been in November 1972. Mm -hmm. And when I arrived there, there were, I saw an elder Western monk. And then I learned that that was Jnana Ponika Terra. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, you see, after the rains retreat, the island hermitage, like other monasteries, would have the katina ceremony, the robe yeah. offering ceremony. And so at that period, Venerable Yanapunika made it a regular practice to join the katina ceremony at island hermitage. Mm -hmm. And so I think I arrived just like a few days after the katina ceremony. And he was still there, so I met him, we had a chat, and then actually we came up together from Dodendua to Colombo on the train. Mm -hmm. And you actually moved to, in 1975, to the Forest Hermitage? Yeah, this was after, in 1975, First, at that time, some people had offered some land to my teacher, Venerable Ananda Maitreya, mm -hmm. in Maharagama, which is a suburb of Colombo, and they were constructing a new temple for him there. Mm -hmm. And so he was spending most of his time in Maharagama. And at this time, a monk from India named Sadarakita had come to stay at the monastery. After, this was after the German monk had expired. Mm -hmm. and so the Indian monk came and was staying in that kuti on the other side of the hill. And so we became friends. And then when, my Indi when the Indian monk finished his time in Sri Lanka, he was going back to India. So he suggested I come with him to India to stay at the monastery of his teacher, mm -hmm. who was the Indian monk named Buddha Rakita. As you mentioned last time, the famous... Yeah, I mentioned last time. So I went to back to India with him mm -hmm. and stayed in uh, Bangalore. And so I stayed there until we arrived March 1975. And then 
in these i think it was december 1975 the indian government gave me notice that i was to be kicked out of india oh yeah i'm just jo joking but um so i'm using the expression kicked out in a joking way it's not that i was doing it engaging in any criminal activity but at that period there were rather tense relations between india mm. and the united states in fact india wasn't even allowing mail to go back and forth between the united states and india mm. to write to my parents mm. i had to send my letter I was sent it to Nyanaponikatera in Sri Lanka, and he would send it to my parents. Mm -hmm. And they would write to him in Sri Lanka, and then he would send their letter to me in India. Mm -hmm. And so the Indian government wouldn't renew my visa to stay in India. And then I had gotten to know Venerable Nyanapunika because sometimes when he would go to Europe, he would ask me to come and stay at the, at the forest hermitage while he was away mm -hmm. to look after the forest hermitage. And after he would return, then we would spend so you know like a week or so together. Mm -hmm. And we found that we had quite a lot of interests in common mm -hmm. and understandings in common. So then when I was given notice that I had to leave India, then I decided to return to Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. And then I told Venerable Nyanapunika, and then he said, in that case, if you're coming back to Sri Lanka, why don't you come and stay with, with us here? Mm -hmm. And so then I came back very end of 1975, mm -hmm. and then I came to stay at the Forest Hermitage. So for about two years or three years, he became then your Upachaya also, I guess. Well, Upachaya is the one who presides over the ordination. Uh, yeah, so he, that's true. He became your Acharya, the one yeah, that like the Acharya, dependence yeah. on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what was, what was drawing you towards the Anaponika? Uh, I'm asking this because we all, I also we also would like to hear more about Nanaponika. What was it that impressed you or made you being able to relate him? You said you you had things in common. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about that? How was he? Okay. Well, we both had. Let us say because we both come from Western backgrounds. And Jewish and, background. Yeah, though I don't think the Judaism, Jewish background served as a strong point of connection. Mm -hmm. That was almost negligible, I would say. Yeah. But it was more like a sort of, a little bit like an intellectualized, philosophical approach to the Dharma. Mm -hmm. And we both like to study the text and sort of to reflect intellectually on the text yeah and we both had like strong well certainly nanaponika had like strong respect for the commentarial tradition mm -hmm. and high regard for the abhidharma which i was just beginning to get acquainted with mm -hmm. and yeah i think it was the period when i stayed When I stayed at the Forest Hermitage while he was in Europe, then he lent me his notebooks in which he had draft translations of portions from the commentaries and sub-commentaries. And I used those to become acquainted with the style of the commentaries mm -hmm. by comparing his translations with the Pali text. <laughs> And so we both sort of emphasized or had the idea that to understand the Dharma properly, it's important to consult the commentaries, even though it, we don't have to subscribe to them like 100%. Mm. And the monks, the other Western monks in Sri Lanka from my generation, often they would come just thinking that 
we become a monk just to practice. Mm -hmm. No need to study the text. Mm -hmm. We just throw ourselves into a full rigorous meditation schedule. Mm -hmm. And that way we're going to attain realization quickly and then go back to our own countries and become meditation teachers. Mm -hmm. And so both of us had some kind of disagreement with that approach. Mm -hmm. And also at that time among some of the Western monks, there was a bit of a cult that had taken root, mm -hmm. centered around the figure. I don't know if you know of Nyanavira Terra. Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. Of course. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, of course. <laughs> I mean, I know quite a lot about him, and yes, yeah, he is a is a figure. Yeah, I know his yeah. notes, and also know the discussion about him. I saw actually his notebook, uh, his original, you know, notes on Dhamma. I yeah. found that in the Forest Hermitage. Uh, have you seen that actually, Orig the original book that he made, the cyclostyle version? No, the notes on Dhamma. This black book. Yeah, that's what I call that's it was cyclo style. That means done on a typewriter. Yeah, it was actually uh, uh, always changed. There were pieces putting on top and yeah. corrected. Yeah. It, it was a whole confusion, that whole book. I, I won wonder how a text could come out of that later. Uh, yeah, I saw it. It's quite a lot of work. Yeah, anyway, mm. there was a kind of bit of a cult among some of the Western monks around Yanavira's interpretation and with the idea. And then he had, there was a Sri Lankan man, uh, sort of fluent in English, sort of English educated, mm -hmm. who became an interpreter of Yanavira and sort of maintained Yanavira's legacy by writing books of his own yeah. Sort of propounding Nyanavira's point of view. Hmm. His name was Weta Muni. Yeah, Weta Muni. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so there was this cult centered around the writings of Nyanavira and the continuation in the works of Mr. Weta Muni. Hmm. And so there was this strong rejection of the Sudhi Magga commentaries, Abhidhamma, just throw this into the fire that's not the dharma mm. and both Nyanaponika and myself we sort of differed from that point of view we thought it's mm. important to also consult you know the commentarial understanding mm. yes, we, were, we, we didn't quite agree with this call it a kind of sutta fundamentalism yeah oh. though the suttas as reinterpreted by Venerable Nyanavira, which, in my opinion, didn't agree in many important respects with the actual intention of the mm. suttas. Yeah. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. There's even a, a small edition uh, or publishing house uh, from that time called Pass Press, right? Which de developed out of that. Yeah, that was it was started by an American monk in Sri Lanka in the mid 1980s mm -hmm. um, in order to publish the, the the works of Venerable Nyanavira to ensure that they don't completely vanish. Yeah. But then he died under rather tragic circumstances just almost immediately after the first edition of the collection called Clearing the Path, right after yeah. that was published. Then it seemed that Path Press was was dead. Mm. Until then, a number of Western monks from Slovenia and Serbia mm. who were ordained in the early 21st century, then they revived Path Press and have kept it going hmm yeah as you know it had some impact on western writers like on Stephen he found that book uh, in the Gaia house library 
Yeah, and it was translated into German by uh, Medico Biku, who is also a big fan of Nia Navira. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he wrote also to you to get some information. But coming back to to you, uh, then you stayed for about two years with uh, Nana Ponica Terra. Yeah, and this would have been, let's see, I came there at the very end of 1975, coming from India. And then I stayed till August 1977. Yeah. Because at that time, then it's what started to weigh on my mind was the fact that when I became, left for Sri Lanka to become a monk, my parents were extremely upset and unhappy, mm -hmm. even to the point of, you know, my, it was almost a traumatic experience, especially for my mother. Mm -hmm. And this was starting to weigh on my mind. So then I thought that I should come back to the United States to try to reconcile with my parents. Yeah. And that you did in, in 1977. You yeah. returned to the US and spent two years at the Lama is Buddhist Monastery of America, New Jersey. So about a, about a year and a half, I think, from September 1977 to May 1979. <laughs> And were you able to reconcile with your parents or to give them attention in that time? Did, did it fulfill your wish? Well, I was able to, you know, to meet them on more occasions. But especially my mother never really was a, never really able to accept, mm. you know, my decision to ordain as a monk and my lifestyle as a monk. Mm. It was always a cause of deep sorrow and regret for her. Hmm. My father's attitude started started to change, but my mother was much more resistant to it. Hmm. Yeah, actually, it's familiar to me because I'm coming from a very religious home, and they never accepted Buddhism at all. You R religious in which religion? Christian, actually, with Jewish background, but Christian. Uh, are yeah, very evangelical and they when i turned towards buddhism they thought that i gonna end up in hell actually very similar to you i as you know i was for four years a monk in thailand and i my intention was to stay as a monk but my parents got very old and uh, uh they were in not good condition and i wanted to come and help them but they said if you come with ropes we're not gonna open the door <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, what I what I heard from my father when I arrived back at I think it was Kennedy Airport coming from Asia in 1977. My parents were waiting for me at the airport, and they saw me at the arrivals mm -hmm. um, terminal before I saw them. And my mother, when they saw me coming down the escalator with my robes and with the alms bowl slung over my shoulder, mm -hmm. my mother said to my father, he's not our son, let's go back. <laughs> yeah, I heard similar things. It's terrible. Yeah, yeah. It's terrible. But in the course of time, you met them more often and could they understand yeah. slowly more your, your inclination towards the Buddhist path? I think my father started to understand a little bit more clearly. My mother, no. She mm. always had a very closed mind. When did your mother pass away? Yeah, she passed in 2001. Okay. Uh -huh. So all yeah, the time. April 2001, yeah. In 2001. So that that's all. That's shortly before you came back to return yeah. to the United States, right? Exactly, yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. So these two years uh, at uh, this Buddhist Monastery of America, New Jersey, and another about three years at, in Washington, also at a, uh, at a Vihara, Buddhist Vihara. 
yeah. Washington Buddhist Vihara. Yeah. Which was one of the oldest, right? Or, or I think it was the first, first Theravadan one. temple established in the United States. Yeah. What did you do during that time? Was that your first, uh, did there your writing actually started? Um, I think I already wrote some essays. Like Nourishing the Roots? Maybe? Yeah, those I wrote in India. In India already. So it's, yeah. it's even older than that time. Yeah, when I was staying in the Bangalore, uh, mm -hmm. Mahabodhi Society of Bangalore. So this must have been your first uh, writing about Buddhism, right? The, the, those writing. essays were, yeah, yeah. How and about then, the, the discourse on the all-embracing net? Yeah, that I, that I did oh during the goodness, period. Yeah. When I was staying at the Forest Hermitage with Venerable Yanaponika. Ah, okay. It was only published during your American uh, stay, right? Yeah, it took. I guess it took some time to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I would have left it with Venerable Yanaponika in 1977, mm -hmm. just shortly before I came back to the U.S. Mm -hmm. And then it was published the next year. Yeah, 1978 or 79. Mm -hmm. But those uh, years uh, when you came back to the US, how did you experience them? Uh, you obviously you went back to Sri Lanka, so you did not really settle in to stay as a monk in in the States. Yeah, originally you say, well, I was staying at the Washington Buddhist Vihara. I went from time to time to the Insight Meditation Society. This was in mm -hmm. Barry, Massachusetts. Yeah. With Sharon Salzburg and yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. and so on, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I did like a meditation retreat there. Let's say it would have been in the autumn of 1981. And then it occurred to me, well, when I ended that retreat, that I wanted to do more intensive meditation. Mm -hmm. And so then I decided that I would go to Burma, to the Mahasi Center mm -hmm. in Burma for, for intensive insight meditation. Mm -hmm. And I started to make preparations from Washington to get the, the visa to go to Burma. Mm -hmm. But as I was in the process of applying for the visa, the Burmese government went through, a, again, one of these, up, up to that point, they were relaxing their it, their admission requirements, and they were starting to allow... Sorry. <laughs> okay. They, they were starting to allow Westerners to come as long as they were accepted registered to stay at monasteries or meditation centers, mm -hmm. but they were not permitted to go wandering on their own through the country. Mm -hmm. But then what happened is that there were some foreign monks, maybe American, European, I don't know, who sort of disregarded that commitment that they had made and just started mm -hmm. to wander on their own through the country. And the government tracked them down and threw them out and then got paranoid and then lay down a firm decision and they threw all of the westerners in the mm. meditation centers out and they mm. said we're not going to allow westerners to come here for meditation mm. so i was already planning to go to asia so i decided to switch my destination to sri lanka and so i came back to sri lanka may 1982 and then I spent that first vasa with Venerable Yanapunika at the Forest Hermitage. And then after the vasa, then I went to stay at um, the meditation monastery, Nisaranavaniya, Mitharigala. Mm -hmm. And so I spent three months there. Then I spent time back at the Forest Hermitage. And then I went back to and spent some time in Colombo at Vajrayarama. And then I went back to Nisaranavaniya 
for the Vasa, this would be the Vasa of 1983, the Vasa of 1983. Nisarana Vanaya is known to be a forest hermitage, a forest monastery with very strict rules yeah, and yeah. a big emphasis on uh, Bomi's style meditation uh, method, like Mahasi Sayadu. Is that correct? Well, Venerable, the, the, the teacher at that time, the Venerable Sri Jnana Rama mm -hmm. Mahatero, was not committed to any one fixed system of meditation. Mm -hmm. Because he had trained both in sort of in the traditional lineages of Samatha meditation, which had been passed down in the forest, the old tradition of forest monasteries in Sri Lanka, and then he had practiced with some of the disciples of Mahasi Soyadur who were teaching in Sri Lanka in the 1950s. Mm. And so he also knew the Burmese system of insight meditation. Mm -hmm. What kind of meditation attracted you the most or was working with you the most? What, what did you emphasize for yourself? Well, during that period when I was staying at Nisaranavaniya, then a venerable Sri Nyana Rama guided me through more or less the Burmese system of insight meditation. Mm -hmm. Which was much like notifying and uh, using the mental notes. Yeah, mental notes. Mm. Yeah. yeah. And then you switch back and forth between the forest hermitage and Nisaranaya Vanaya. Yeah, yeah. At that time, the forest hermitage was on was a building on their own. They were not uh, uh, together with the neighboring uh, monastery called Sedanaya Rama. Yeah, exactly. Sedanaya Rama. Exactly. Well, the, the, you know, the, even though they're separate buildings and sort of administratively they're a bit separate, but like say that they, the two sort of function together. Uh -huh. So you were going probably on arms room together, shared the same dining hall uh, and so on. Yeah, most of the time we would have the meals separately, mm -hmm. but there would be a few days each month where we with people would offer the arms for both places together. And in that case, then we would have the meal together yeah. in the St. Anayaka Rama, which has a bigger uh, a dining hall. Now it belongs together. Last year I was there, was able to stay, stay there for uh, six weeks. And uh, now the bows is one, it's all belong to Siranaya Karama. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the building where Nenaponika stayed and where you stayed is rather small. Right, it has a katia, uh, or now it has a small kuti uh, for an attendant outside. I don't know if that already existed in your time. No, an outside kuti, no. Yeah, that's where I stayed. But the uh, there was room only for about two mon monks, as I see yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. The forest hermitage itself just has room for like two regular monks, and then we had a room that could be used by a visiting monk. Uh, that's probably the room in the back uh, next to the kitchen, to the old kitchen. No, no, that little room next to the kitchen, in the time that I was there, that's where the kapia, the attendant, would stay. Ah, okay, I see. Yeah, the kuti, there was no kuti there at yeah. that time, no outside kuti. Yeah. So there was a larger downstairs room with its own bathroom. Mm -hmm. That's where Venerable Nyanaponika stayed from, well, let's see, from the 1990s on, or maybe late 1980s on, from about maybe 1988 on. Yeah, that's where the Venerable uh, Chanda Vimala Taro is staying now. He yeah. showed me the room of uh, Yeah, I don't know Nyanaponika those. Yeah. Okay, then upstairs there were two bedrooms. And so I would stay in one bedroom and then the other bedroom would be the guest room. Mm -hmm. 
So if you were staying upstairs and Nana Ponyga was staying downstairs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And at that time, you, I, I mean, Jana Ponikater used always handwriting during his time, right? He, I think he never used the typewriter. He was always uh, no. handwriting. But you must no. have... You, no, he no. used also typewriter. He had, a, he had a typewriter, yeah, for many, many years, yeah. Ah, okay. I never yeah. saw pictures. He had a special typewriter made so that it would be possible to type the... Di diacritical marks, the polydiacritical marks. Mm -hmm. Even with the typewriter. Yeah. Ah, okay. Yeah. So the, uh, like the tilde, the, anyway. Yeah. He had those marks like the macron, that's the bar that goes over the letters, the tilde, yeah. uh, the under dot and over dot. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. No, I never saw the typewriter, but what I saw is a, a old German sirene. Is it called? I mean, to warn if there is a, t uh, a bombing, you know. Ew, ew, ew. Do you remember that? No, I don't know that at all. Maybe it was brought there, but they had really actually uh, from wartime uh, uh, this hand machine where you could warn everyone yeah. around bombing is coming. Yeah. No, I never saw that. Okay. I want to put some more water in my teapot. Please now. go ahead. Yeah. And but now we are entering the time uh, of the ten year stay with Nyana Ponika Terra, and and that in the beginning of the time you were also appointed editor of the Buddhist Publishing Society in 1984. Yeah, I should just explain a little background. So mm -hmm. my intention, okay, after the Vasa of 1983, my intention was to stay at the Saranavaniya for more meditation. Mm. But, you know, I have this chronic head pain condition. Already at that time. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. And so I was going around, you know, from February, March 1983, taking different types of treatment. Oh, um, actually, though, from November 1983. Wait, let me just get the chronology. Yeah, after, after that Vasa, then I went to different places to try different methods of treatment. Yeah, I was trying um, acupuncture, Singhalese herbal medicine, more acupuncture. And then I went to the south of Sri Lanka where there was a Burmese monk at a temple there and I was staying with him. And that Burmese monk had some connection with island hermitage, and so he knew Yanaponika Terra. And he said to me that you have special karma connection with Yanaponika Terra. And he's old now. There's nobody to continue the work of the Buddhist Publication Society. It's your duty to go there to help Yanaponika Terra. So that's when I made the decision. So my original plan was to go back to meet the Regula for more meditation. But he sort of spurred me on to go instead to go back to the forest hermitage mm -hmm. to stay with Nyanaponika Terra. And so I came to join Venerable Nyanaponika. This here I remember the exact date that it was April 16th, 1984, that I returned okay. to the forest hermitage. So if you remember exactly that date, that must have been an important time for you. Just as the date stands out. And then you stayed with him 10 years and uh, there, that time for me is very interesting. And I would like to show you some pictures about your stay in Sri Lanka. Yeah. But you might want to comment on, I, I, I just used my mobile to capture some pictures that I found in the forest hermitage. Uh, where is it? 
The first one is just from a newspaper. It's not of your time. It's actually later. But, oh, sorry. This is the one that I wanted to show. That is the time, I don't know. Was that the beginning of your time with Nyana Ponika Terra? No, it has to be after 1987, because behind us there is an American Buddhist nun whose name was Ayanyana Siri. Mm -hmm. She had come originally, she came to Sri Lanka maybe 1980, 81, while I was still in the US in the Washington Buddhist Vihara. So she came as a laywoman together with her husband. Um, just because they wanted to devote their life to meditation. Mm -hmm. And somehow they felt inwardly directed to Sri Lanka. So they were living in Kandy. And then her husband had a kind of chronic kidney condition, which deteriorated. And her husband passed away, maybe 1981. And she had previously, she had met Venerable Nyanapunik on some occasions. And she offered to help him with his work for the Buddhist Publication Society. Mm -hmm. Her name at that time was Helen Wilder. Oh. So she became like his editorial assistant. And she would come like every Tuesday to the Forest Hermitage and meet with Venerable Nyanapunika. They would discuss matters concerning the BPS. And then after I came to stay with Venerable Nyanapunika, then I of course, we were the three of us would meet there together. Mm -hmm. And then as time went on, she felt more and more sort of the draw to the monastic life. And so I remember it was in June 1987 that she became ordained as a Buddhist nun, the Ten Precept Nun under Venerable Nyanapun, under Venerable Nyanaponika. And so this picture has to be sometime after 1987, because as you can see, she's in monastic robes. Mm -hmm. So I'm at least 43 here, probably 44, something like that. And this is a very old picture. I don't, that yeah, must this is be much older, yeah. for your time even, but it's very typical for for Nanaponi Katera to uh, be surrounded by a lot of notebooks and books on his Yeah, I think this picture could have been published in a German magazine, a German cultural magazine, perhaps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that yeah. so? Do you, is that the fact? Yeah, it's well known in Germany because of that. But I found actually the original one in, in, Ken, uh, in the Forest Hermitage as you can see, quite old at that time. So not the printed version. Yeah, you could see on the wall, above the calendar, there's a photo of Venerable Nyana Teloka. And, and there's a calendar to the left, and then above the calendar, there's yeah. Nyana Teloka. And exactly. then the other calendar with that wheel. That's from Germany, right? That's from the Paul Davis group. Paul Davis group, exactly. They do an annual calendar. And they're still producing it, actually, every they're year. Still doing it. Yes. And this is another picture. Uh, I don't know the third monk, but definitely Niana Punika was not hearing very well at that time anymore. Is that true? Yeah. Yeah, that's why he's using this kind of hearing aid. So the person visiting is speaking into the this device, mm -hmm. and then the sound comes to through the through the earphones. Mm -hmm. I think this could be a British monk named Bodhidhamma. How old would you have been at that time? I think Venerable Nyanapunika got these earphones about 1990. So I'm somewhere between in my late 1950s, uh, uh, in my late 50s. In your late I'm sorry, 50s? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. 40s, right? The late 40s, late 40s. Yeah, late 40s. 
I, I found only one cassette tape of re, uh, recording Juliana Ponica yeah. um, in the Forest Hermitage, but the monks there wouldn't allow me to take it with me to uh, digitalize it. Uh, and I don't know if there are any other recordings of his talking or conversation or teaching, whatever. What was the recording? Uh, that was a conversation uh, uh, with someone. I'm not sure. It might have been even Ayakima. I'm not sure. But there must have been already tape recorders in usage. But I couldn't listen to it because uh, I was without a device to listen to it. And, yeah. Mm. But these closets of books uh, in the back here of this picture, uh, they are still in the forest hermitage in the what used to be the kitchen it is now the storage room for those old books. And uh, as far as I can understand, you were really well equipped with books from from any source. I mean, a lot of uh, things from the Pali Text Society, but also uh, original Singhalese and Burmese scripts, uh, this, this on leaves, right? And all kinds of books about Buddhism, even Mahayana and Vajrayana. And uh, uh, you had really a, a huge library. Uh, it was pretty good. I think not such a, not so huge, but. And it was all used a lot. Yeah. So this is you giving an address at a place, I don't know where, somewhere probably in Colombo. Yeah, I wouldn't know where it is. No idea. And there you are, you seem to be traveling in India. Or is it somewhere in Sri Lanka? You found this in the forest from it? Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. You must have at this time had a lot of walking because your feet uh, oh. are scrapped up. Gee, I have no idea. You have no idea where this was? No, no idea why I have my feet wrapped in bandages. Yeah. So a big mystery. There must be some cave monastery. So I, I would almost suggest it could be uh, a Ajanta or somewhere. No, it wouldn't have been Ajanta. Hmm. The stupa looks like that. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, without any other related photos, it's hard to. Yeah. And this was a picture that was taken for an article uh, about you. And I guess that's the walk from Candy Publishing Society uh, house in Candy uh, through the park to the Forest Mon uh, her Hermitage, right? I think this is a staged walk for a photograph. Yeah. I think this was after I was already in the United States and I came back to visit Sri Lanka in 2002. Mm -hmm. And then they wanted to publish an article in the Buddhist public EPS newsletter about my visit to Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. And so for a purpose of a photo, they had me walk along the path mm -hmm. in, in the Udawatta Kelly. In the yeah, park. exactly. Udawatta Kelly. And I don't know who, what venerable monk this is. Yeah, that's venerable and under my trail. That's Nanda. actually Ananda Maitreya Mahatya. Okay. Yeah, we visited him after his, let's see, it was about the time of his 100th birthday or slightly wow. after his 100th birthday. Wow. Mm -hmm. And then I had some books called The Great Chronicle of the Buddhas that I decided to donate to him for his birthday. Mm -hmm. And so here he's at the temple in Maharagama that had been built for him. Mm -hmm. 
in the 19, early 1970s. So this would likely be 1995 or 96. Mm -hmm. So I'm stopping the pictures here. Yeah. I can't see you, Bante. No, I, in order for me to see the photos, well, I had to. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and at that time, you, probably Nana Punica Mahatea was uh, was getting too old to write, so you did more and more writing for him, right? I guess that's the background that you became the editor and later even the president of the Buddhist Publishing Society. Yeah, well, in 1984, this is shortly after I came back to stay with him, mm -hmm. he decided that, um, you know, at this time, he's already getting close to his 83rd year. Mm -hmm. And it's too hard for him to continue that work. Mm -hmm. And so then he asked me if I would take over as the editor. Mm -hmm. And at first, I didn't want to do that, because I didn't want to be burdened with that work myself. Mm -hmm. But then I realized that I had no choice, and so I had to accept mm -hmm. that appointment. When you accepted that, uh, there was already the house in downtown Candy at the lake, uh, so it was not uh, entirely done in the forest hermitage anymore, right? Oh no, the Buddhist Publication Society had established itself in, first there was a small house alongside the lake, a converted dent dentist office mm -hmm. in maybe 1960 or so. Uh -huh. And then because the volume of materials was increasing and it couldn't operate from that small house. So then in the early 1980s, they started the construction of the, of the new building. Yeah. And then that building was completed in 1984, we had the opening ceremony. Uh, it was completed in 1985. And then we had the opening ceremony in 1985, mm -hmm. April 1985. And then an extension was built in the back, which I think was opened in the around the year could be 2002 or so. Mm -hmm. So, and how was your daily life uh, at that time? Did you have to go like almost to work down to the Buddhist Publishing Society to do writing or editing? No, I would do almost all of that, pretty much all of that work at the Forest Hermitage, but I would just go like once a week mm -hmm. to check on anything that needed my, that, that needed my contribution. Yeah. And you had extensive uh, correspondence with people who uh, sent in drafts or you had uh, correspondence with Buddhist uh, professors even. Uh, yeah, yeah. I saw a lot of letters, so that must have been a very much a, a time of study and exchange and, and writing papers and essays and re-editing. So I imagine you guys have been very busy behind your typewriter at that time still in the beginning of the 80s, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there was a lot of typewriting that I saw. Yeah, in those days we didn't have computers, so we had to do everything on typewriter. And much later, you started in Sri Lanka with uh, with word processing, right? But you didn't have electricity in the forest hermitage, right? At a certain point, we got a solar solar energy system, which it didn't have that much power. There were maybe a couple of batteries and a, a few solar panels, <laughs> and so it was enough to do to operate. A simple, you know, a, a simple a computer that would do simple word processing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think we had at the time I was there. We didn't have internet connection in the forest hermitage. 
So you probably work with something like Word 5.5 on DOS, uh, a DOS version, right? I was using, I think, the program called Word Perfect. Ah, yeah, Word Perfect. I remember Which that. Which is now too. buried someplace in the cemetery. <laughs> yes, exactly. In cyberspace. Yeah. And emails came in through the office of the publishing society and was printed out for you, right? Yeah, yeah. So the very early days where and then to reply, email was... I would have, Yeah, that's, I would have to go into the office about once a week to reply to emails. Yeah. So, but already uh, fax was replaced by email, which is quite, uh, quite a change already. I heard the story of you where you said there was a time where someone told you it is possible to copy in a page here and have it printed out somewhere else. And you did not expect that to exist, which is a... Yeah, yeah. He was telling me about this machine. Yeah. This is around 1985. He said, mm. like, if you, you take a letter and you put it in this machine, mm. say you're in... Sri Lanka and Colombo, mm. you put it in this machine, you press a button, and somebody in New York City will get a copy. At this, very, very soon, right? Uh, immediately, yeah. yeah. Immediately. Mm. And then I thought, no, you're, you're teasing me, not possible. Yeah. But it turned out that there, that was the fax machine. Yeah. But the fax machine was not used so much in Sri Lanka, I guess, right? There were places, even in Kandy, like little shops. Mm -hmm. I think they would call they would call themselves communication shops. Yeah. Which would have fax machines, and if you wanted to send a fax, you would go to the shop. Yeah. And then you give them your letter, and then they would send it as a fax. Yeah. And they would pick up, they would receive faxes intended for you. But I, I read a little bit through your notes, which were left there. And I found that you had really concise reading and knowledge about very different aspects of Buddhism, even, you know, to Tibetan philosophy, you know, like you're referring to uh, Mahamudra and uh, to all kinds of things, which I was surprised that a Theravada monk in in a forest hermitage has so much reading. But you obviously, really? yeah. But I don't think I know anything about Mahamudra. But, sure were yeah, written? and Mahaati and the Middle Pass, Madhyamika, you know. Yeah, Madhyamika, I've studied. Yeah, maybe it was more about Madhyamika, probably. Yeah, Mahamudra, Mahamudra. Mahaati, I don't know. Mm -hmm very much about them at all. Yeah, but you must have a uh, wide reading and studying in the in the forest hermitage at that time. Is that true? At that time, I didn't get a much chance to do very wide reading. Mm -hmm. But earlier, when I was staying in the Tibetan monastery in New Jersey, Ah, okay, from that time. that time. I did quite a lot of reading in the Madhyamaka, even yeah. in Sanskrit and Sanskrit, and even yeah. in... With Nagarjuna and... Yeah, and his the commentary on Nagarjuna, Chandrakirti, Tsongkhapa. Yeah. Tsongkhapa, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And uh, you wrote quite some articles. I think all of it was printed somewhere, but there, you did quite a lot of writing at that time in these 10 years in the forest hermitage? I didn't get that much chance to do my own writing in that period because a lot of time was taken up with editing. Okay. Uh -huh. and having to do proofreading and preparation for publication. Mm -hmm. But so you did... I did, do, I did do at that time, yeah, let's say from 1985 to 1988, then I was preparing, sort of editing, revising Venerable Jnana Moli's translation of the Majjhima Nikaya. Yeah, which took you about three years, you told me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
though it didn't appear in print until 1995. Did you expect at that time that this translation would uh, lead you on a path of becoming a translator of the Nikayas? Well, I had already several years before that, you know, I did the translation of the and there were four suttas together with their commentaries, mm -hmm. the Brahmajala Sutta. That was the one published, it was done 1976, 77. And the Mahanidana Sutta? And then after that, the Mula Pariyaya Sutta, which I think was published 1980. Mula Pariyaya, exactly, yeah. Yeah. 1980, first time, exactly. Yeah. And then the Mahanidana Sutta with his commentary. It was done 1983-84, but I think published 1985. And the Samana Pala Sutta was the yeah, third that one. Was done, I think completed 1988, or maybe published 1988. Mm -hmm. But those were single suttas that you yeah. uh, dedicated to a lot of yeah. time and also yeah. reading and translation of the commentary that goes along. But yeah. when you started to uh, re-edit and almost retranslate or or correct the right, uh, translation of Nyanamoli of the Majjhima Nikaya, yeah. that made you known as a translator of the Nikayas very much, right? Because yeah. that yeah. was so well accepted. Mm. Yeah. There must have been a big need for a fresh translation of the Majjhima Nikaya, even though parts of it had been translated before, uh, published before, but not in a revised version, is, isn't it? Yeah, actually, there was a British monk named Prakanti Palo yeah. had published a selection from the Nyanamoli's translation of the Majjhima Nikaya in, in Thailand, right? In Thailand, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm called, I think, a treasury of the Buddha's words, hmm. which doesn't really indicate the content very well. How did you, uh, how did it happen that wisdom publication became interested in your translation? Yeah, of course, it, it, it wasn't my translation of, of the yeah. Bajumanikai, it's actually Nyana Moli's translation. Hmm. Okay, so somehow the director of wisdom publications at that time had learned that Venerable Jnana Moli had left behind the draft translation of the Majjhima Nikaya. Mm -hmm. And they had recently published Maurice Walsh's translation of the, of Diga, the Diga Nikaya, Nikaya. Mm -hmm. in the long discourses. Yeah. And so they wrote to Venerable Jnana, or this, the executive director of wisdom, Nick mm -hmm. Rebush, he wrote to Venerable Jnana Ponika, mm -hmm asking Venerable Jnana Ponika if he could prepare Jnana Moli's translation of the Majjhima Nikaya for the entire translation for publication by Wisdom Publications. Mm -hmm. And then Venerable Jnana Ponika wrote to Nick Rebush and he said, this is 1984, he said, I'm now 83 years old, my vision is deteriorating, <laughs> <laughs> my energy level has been dropping. So he said, I won't undertake that myself, but I have a young American monk staying with me who has a good knowledge of Pali, mm. and he could do it. <laughs> <laughs> and so then Venerable Yanapati could pass that job on to me. And did you do the editing of Abhidhamata Sangaha? before that revision of middle length discourses? No, no, that came later. Came later, yeah. Yeah, okay, so then when the Majjhima Nikaya was published by Wisdom Publications, then Nick Rebush, still the executive director for Wisdom, asked me, what are the other Nikayas? <laughs> so I said, well, there's the Sangyuta Nikaya and the Anguttara Nikaya. And then he said, which would you prefer to translate? <laughs> Neither of them, you said, probably. Maybe I said, wait, wait a <laughs> moment. But anyway, I wound up doing the Sangyuta Nikaya. Yeah. 
which came out in in small uh, parts, like the five books of the Sanyuta Nikama came out separately first. No, 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 oh. no. No? No, it first came out in two volumes. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. But then later Wisdom used the thin paper and put it all into one volume. Mm -hmm. There were two parts. I, I started with the full volume, but I, I heard that it came out in smaller parts, so that was actually two volumes. But when did you start to translate the Sanyutta Nikaya? I started that in 1989. Mm -hmm. But it took a long time to complete until 1998, 99, uh -huh. for me to complete it. Of course, there were a lot of interruptions because of my the work coming in through the Buddhist Publication Society. Hmm. I remember at one point I had to put it aside and was not able to return to it for about three years. Yeah. And then especially there was a collection, the first volume and the was first division in the Sangyutta Nikaya, the collection of verses. Mm -hmm. That you did on the end, right? You, pretty much at the end. It yeah, because of the difficulty of yeah, verses. Yeah, it's very problem. difficult and required a lot of notes. Yeah. And then there was a Dutch monk, Jana Tusita, who became very enthusiastic about tracking down parallels to those mm -hmm. suttas on the verses and sort of sending them to me. And then so that put me under pressure to do sort of comparison of the Pali version with the versions, the trans, the parallel versions in other lines of transmission. Mm -hmm. And so all of that took a lot of time. This Nyana Tushita, uh, uh, he be became the uh, successor of you later, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But when he wrote you, he must have stayed somewhere else, so you did not meet in person. He no, was in Sri Lanka somewhere else, right? No, at that time mm -hmm. he went to stay in Australia with Achan Brahmavangzo. Ah, okay, I see. Uh -huh. Yeah, so he spent a couple of years in Australia. Yeah. He was the last editor of the Buddhist Publishing Society. They, there was no one preceding him, right? Uh, uh, succeeding yeah. him. Yeah, that's why I think it's sort of, you know, just tottering along. Yeah. And from the... He, he, left, he left the monastic life, he left Sri Lanka. Yeah, and yeah. I think occasionally he does some, what I've re received from them over the years are just like, reprints of older books in sort of a new, more colorful formats, but yeah. not new material. He did a translation and an analysis of the uh, Sutta Vibhanga uh, yeah, of, of the Mokka. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he, he left without leaving uh, a note, actually. He cleared up his place and went back to the Netherlands, but never came back, the monks in the Forest Hermitage say. And then they assume that he disrobed and uh, heard it from others. Yeah. yeah. But coming back to your writing, uh, there was also the editing of the great disciples of the Buddha, which I understand was a collection of uh, different previous writings. Also Helmut Hecker from yeah. Germany, uh, which was then translated in English. And to his surprise, when it came back, to Germany as a full edition, uh, the editing house, I think I, I have it here actually, uh, the O.W. Bart uh, printed it in German and it was retranslated it into German, but they didn't allow Helmut Hecker to, uh, to, to contribute his German version, they wanted it translated from the English fresh into oh, really yeah, yeah. he was very disappointed about that and it's one of the most expensive buddhist books that we have actually the price is still on it is uh, 58 uh that was german mark at that time very expensive 
<laughs> but you contributed with a lot of articles too, right? To that book. No, only one. Only, only one. Uh, only the Mahaka, Mahakachana chapter. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the others were all, the one on Sariputta was Jnanaponika, mm -hmm. and all of the other chapters were originally, but from originals by Helmut Hecker, mm -hmm. were translated by, into English by other people, and then in some cases expanded by Venerable Jnanaponika. Mm -hmm. With uh, other material, with additional material. Yeah, and I think we should also mention uh, the very well-received trend editing of this book, which was also in that time, right? Yeah, yeah. You see, originally the BPS, Yabidamata, was, Sangha. the BPS was publishing Venerable Narada's or called the Manual of Abhidhamma. Mm -hmm. which just had the Pali text, his translation, and then some notes, just a yeah. few notes. And then I started, it had to be reprinted, so I started just reviewing it and doing some editing in order to prepare it for a reprint, a simple mm -hmm. reprint of Venerable Narada's version. Mm -hmm. But I realized that to make it comprehensible, it needed much more explanation mm. than Venerable Narada provided in his notes. Mm. And so I drew on a lot of the material that I had studied years earlier with my teacher, Venerable Ananda Maitreya, mm -hmm. drawing upon some of the commentaries that we studied together. And then also I consulted with a Burmese Abhidhamma specialist mm -hmm. living for a long time in England. This was U Revita Dhamma. Mm -hmm. And he provided some additional material. And then we compiled in that volume the explanatory guide to explain in detail each section. Mm -hmm. And then one of my contacts in Sri Lanka, an American woman who became a nun, she had studied Abhidhamma with the Burmese monk Usilananda in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And she had these tables that Us or charts that Usilananda had prepared. So that's where the charts come from. Yeah. Yeah. There are so, quite a lot of charts in it. Yeah. Yeah. So we wrote to Usilananda to get permission to use his charts. Uh huh. And who added all these indexes and textual sources and Oh, that I had to do myself. Did you do that uh, via cards, or how did you organize that, or already by computer? The index? Uh, yeah, those to make an index is, is quite a lot of work. How did you do that at that time? Without digital help, right? No, no, no. No computer. I would never use a computer to make an index. So you did this out of memory, or you you were no, just reading? I would read through and then for each make notes each uh -huh. important term, note the page number where it occurs. Okay, so that means you had to go through the whole text again and make notes on the subject that you think fit in or should be in the index. I've done that with every of all of these books. But that is a huge and lot of work. It's amazing. Yeah, I would never use a computer to do that because computer can't just, or at least the way the computers that I have can't distinguish what is an important reference and what is just a no, no. casual reference. It's sort of, it takes human discernment. Only for that, I have to bow down because that is an amazing word, all your indexes, which I actually uh, profited from a lot. I have to say I'm using those indexes a lot. Uh, it's amazing. So you must have done a lot of work at in these 10 years when you stayed with Nana Ponika Terra, even or also later the uh, following 10 years. But it's amazing uh, how much you you did. Um, you must have been uh, working all day at that time. I cannot even understand how you can produce so many translation and work at that time. Just did it, that's all. 
there was a, a clear daily schedule that you followed i don't think i had such like a fixed schedule hmm. Because sometimes other things would come up, like interruptions. Mm. Um, but generally, I think the schedule would be like to start this kind of work. Well, usually like after breakfast, then we would go for a walk from the hermitage down to the lake mm. or a pond. There was a pond at the entrance of the forest. Sometimes one route, there were, there were two, two routes to get to the pond. Mm -hmm. So that takes between 30 minutes and 40 minutes. Mm -hmm. And then maybe work from, say, 8 to 11 in the morning. Mm -hmm. Then take, after lunch, take a rest. Then start again, maybe 1.30 in the afternoon till 4.30 in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. 4.35, then another walk down to the lake or around the round route around the forest mm. and then have Ilampasa, that's a refreshment mm -hmm. then session of chanting meditation and that's it yeah i didn't i think i didn't do work serious work in the evening mm. so this is basically your life of 50 years being a monk that you follow this uh, this daily schedule of eating only in the morning until noon and being dedicated to dhamma work right yeah let me ask you i don't know you looked on your watch how much time do we have left like five or ten minutes about ten minutes yeah okay i i'm curious about uh the way you did your translation uh, you must have had your own um, dictionary uh, that you wrote along with your translation because you decided for certain terms to be translated in a certain with a certain rendering right yeah, yeah. so you must have made your notes all along uh, and and decide what you use and i think you used mainly the same rendering usually for one uh expression in in pali right yeah though over the years i would sometimes like change the rendering from from the majima nikaya to sanyuta nikaya i can see the rend the change but also for, to the anguttara nikaya change it again changed again yeah, at some changed, points, yeah, right? yeah. yeah some terms yeah. would change yeah and would you uh give someone your draft uh to go through or uh um, was it edited edited by someone or was it was someone reading uh to to correct it yeah especially with the sangyuta nikaya the connected discourses mm -hmm. i had sent the files to this venerable jana tusita who was mm -hmm. in australia and he read it and made comments often very helpful comments yeah and he shared it with some of the other monks there. Mm. I think it was in uh, Bhante Sujato was there at the time mm -hmm. with Achan Brahmavangzo. And Achan Bra with some things he shared with Achan Brahmavangzo. And one thing I, I didn't like in the Sangyuta Nikaya with the, that translation, Achan Brahmavangzo insisted that I should translate Nibita as revulsion, I think. And you use usually disenchantment, right? Yeah, but mm. I accepted his urging to change it to revulsion. And now I don't like it, but it's there and oh. I don't want to start making extensive changes. You have to change the whole sentence structure if you use go back to disenchantment. So you listen to the advice of others in, in terms of rendering a certain term, but how about the corpus of uh, text was it uh, corrected in like was your English corrected by someone or was it just done by yourself? Yeah, n I think nobody does correct the English. So, but I think I think Jnana, I think I would give to that nun at least at certain point. 
I uh, Nyana Siri, I think she did read the Sangyutta Nikaya translation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she was still reading at that time. But not the, of course, the Angotana Nikaya was done after I was back in the U.S. Yeah. Actually, pretty much after she had passed away. So you yourself were re reading your text and correcting it. It was not a group of correctors who were helping you. No, I didn't have a, like, um, the Chinese translator Xuanzang had a, mm -hmm. a team working under him. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't have that. I do have a team, fortunately, who helps me. Also, those who are able to correct Pali rendering, uh, who are good at Pali. Yeah. I could not imagine how someone can can really write in such a uh, fairly consistent way like you do uh, all by himself. I have to bow down again, which I mean honestly. Yeah. Uh, you are so precise in the way you use language. It's amazing. I profited a lot from your translation, so I can say that with confidence that yeah. is a very clear uh, style of translation and also yeah. language. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Which just brings us to the end of those 30 years, basically. There is this incident that you were asked uh, by the United Nations to uh, give an address on the Vesak day, but I would like to put this, even if it was in your Sri Lankan time, into the next session, because that is more about your American activity, so to say. Yeah, though at that time I was still living in Sri Lanka. Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. You still you, want to put it in? No, if you, if you still have time, I, I would be interested to know the Buddha and his Dhamma was the address, and I think you were the first Buddhist monk to be invited for. Yeah, it was yeah. even the early first Vesak celebration of the United Nations, wasn't it? Yeah, this developed out of. I think it was 1998. There was a conference mm -hmm. held in Sri Lanka, a sort of pan Buddhist conference, mm -hmm. and. At that time, a monk from New York, a Sri Lankan monk from the New York Buddhist Vihara, Venerable mm -hmm. Piantisa, came for this conference, and he met the Sri Lankan foreign minister. Um, okay, the name escapes me right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, and they discuss, because the Sri Lankan foreign minister was also I think the Sri Lankan representative to the United Nations. Mm -hmm. And so he, they discussed the idea of making Vesak an official holiday at the United Nations, because other religions had their official holidays, yeah. but not the Buddhists. And so they had this discussion, and then it turned out that the foreign minister must have had discussion with his colleagues at the United Nations. And they agreed to make Vesak an official UN celebration. Mm. And so then they decided at that celebration to have a guest speaker come each time each year mm. to give a keynote address. And so I had known Venerable Piatisa because when I would come to visit my parents in New York, I would pay a visit to the New York Vihara and spend like a day or so with Venerable Piatisa. Mm. And he didn't feel that his English was up to the mark for delivering the lecture himself. So he had recommended that I be the one to give that lecture. And so then they invited me to come and give that lecture. And you flew to the United States, to, to New York, only to address uh, the... Well, also to visit my... Uh, I use that opportunity also to visit my parents. But you were still at that time staying in Sri Lanka. Yeah, I was still living in Sri Lanka. This would have yeah. been... Well, I would have gone in May 19... <laughs> May 2000, May of the year 2000. Is there something uh, that you want to add of this time of Sri Lanka that is important to you?
Well, we didn't deal with the death of Nyanaponika and what happened. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, in 1994, right? Yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah, but my time has come up now. I hear Shall that. we pick this up next time then? We could do it next time, yeah. Oh, yes, let's do that. Yeah, though I just say officially thanks again for okay. the second part, and I'm looking forward to meet you next month. Okay. If anything comes up, then I'll let you know. Goodbye, Bante. Okay, take care.